Behind me is the single most important field in Western civilization. It is the birthplace of democracy. And yet it's just a little bit of farmland. And there's some hedges. So what's so important about this field? It's just grass. And it was also just grass in 1645. I just had to glance, I couldn't remember. The, there's an info board here. But don't worry about these. These give very minimalist information and for some strange reason portray the royalists in a really good light. That might be something to do with how history turned out, that we're now a constitutional monarchy and not a democracy, but for a brief period in time we were a kind of shitty democracy under the dictatorship of Oliver Cromwell. Yeah, Britain's a messed up country, but this is where democracy happened, in the form of a battle. And to understand it, we have to go back to a year beforehand. You see, the parliamentarians were losing the war against the royalists in the English Civil War. And that's important to our story here. And it's quite windy, so I'm going to turn this way to shield the mic. Hopefully you're not hearing wind noise now. So, the, uh, what Cromwell had done is he'd gone into Parliament and he'd passed a law saying that uh, no, uh, no person who's a member of Parliament can command in the field because he wanted to get rid of the hereditary peers. He wanted a talent-based army in his new model army. That is, the foundation of the British Army today was born in that parliamentary session. And yet, despite being a politician, Cromwell was a commander in the field in this battle. But he wasn't THE commander in the field, that was Lord Fairfax, a hereditary peer. So, I don't exactly know what that ordinance was about. But, importantly, a year before Fairfax had left his cavalry at Taunton for a siege down in Devon, somewhere I think, for Taunton, yeah, anyway. He had no cavalry and he had been laying siege to Oxford, which was, at that point, the royalist capital. And Oxford was running low on supplies, the siege was close to victory, but the parliamentarians were losing in Leicester. Leicester needed relief. So Fairfax was ordered to relieve Leicester and he marched north from Oxford and headed on over until he got to a windmill somewhere over there that's now an obelisk it's no longer there and they came into I'm tripping over my audio cable they came into contact with the royalist army that was marching up to Scotland to join forces with some Marquis or others army and they were that was going to reinforce the royalist army and then they would win but battle was joined in what would turn out to be the most decisive battle in the history of democracy. Over there were the royalists and over there the parliamentarians and right where I'm standing were some dragoons under parliamentary control and they were captained by, hang on, I know this, Oki. Yes, Oki's dragoons, only about 800 of them. That was all the cavalry Fairfax had until Cromwell arrived on the scene the night before the battle with his cavalry. And at that point, Fairfax had set him up, set himself up on a ridge, which I've been trying to work out where it is. Yeah, there's a ridge here somewhere. And Fairfax had set himself up there. And because he was a good commander, that was the best position in the field. And it was all looking good. And then Cromwell turned up with his cavalry and said, my cavalry can't roam in the field when you're fighting behind a ridge. God damn it, man, move the army. So they did. And they went to a more disadvantageous position. And it very nearly cost democracy everything. As battle was joined, the royalists were first came under fire from Oki's dragoons just by this hedgerow. And the dragoons were fought back. There was only 800 of them and then the royalist charge down the centre happened and they hit the centre of the parliamentarians and on the parliamentarians left flank nearest us now they were facing 
Prince, I know this one, I'm not going to look, Prince Rupert of the Rhine? I'm going to check. Oh, come on, come on, come on. It doesn't say, it's here somewhere. Prince Rupert of the Rhine. Anyway, I'm going to go with that, even if I have to correct myself in a caption. And the parliamentarian's left flank collapsed. And here's the interesting thing, and it actually, to this day, in the British Army, they still refer to an officer as a Rupert. It's sort of a, yeah, a diss, you know. He's just a Rupert, an idiot, you know, because they're like, socially higher than us, don't know what they're doing. When the left flank of the parliamentarians collapsed and Oki's dragoons came to assist and it was all just going terribly wrong and the centre of the parliamentarians line was weakening and that was starting to break, Prince Rupert pursued the routing left flank of the parliamentarians instead of turning his cavalry toward the centre and collapsing the centre of the parliamentarian line. Meanwhile, over on the right flank, Cromwell's cavalry had defeated, hang on, I'll look it up, had defeated um, somebody, either Maurice or Langdale, anyway, whoever was commanding the left. Cromwell's cavalry emerged victorious. Battles are always won on the right flank, and this battle was no exception. The battle was spinning. Cromwell's right was winning, the Royalists' right were winning. But Cromwell turned his cavalry to the centre, and in the centre, the Royalist army collapsed as they were hit by the cavalry. And it's starting to rain. So, I'm going to very quickly surmise this little clip and then head back to the studio. So, the Royalist line collapsed, Oki's dragoons recovered, joined the battle, and there was a few hundred of them left, and 6,000 Royalists died, and Britain got a parliament. Until Cromwell died, the dictatorship was over, sorry, parliament, <laughs> well, we kept a sort of parliament, this constitutional monarchy that we have today, and, well, the rest of Europe was influenced, I guess, we have democracies now in the West, sort of. It was all here. I am stood on the spot where once was a great oak tree, and the royalist centre is about 450 metres over there, so, you know, roughly somewhere that way. In amongst this copse of trees that I'm stood in is where King Charles hid during the battle when it first broke out and he came under fire. So when Oki's dragoons marched up the hedgerow just up there, the king took cover behind this oak tree that they've chopped down. The, uh, that's my feet up here. So, um, yeah, I guess... Uh, I mean, it even had a name. They called it King Charles's Oak. But I guess the farmer wanted the land. He said, the farmer's not doing anything with this bit. They just got rid of it. Removed it from history. I'll keep that up. 400 years ago, this was a windmill. It's now a monument erected by the local Lord and Lady of the Manor of Naseby, the Fitzgeralds. It's an interesting plaque because it talks a lot about how the country was plunged into anarchy, absolute anarchy, uh, because the British people revolted against the just rule of the monarchs. And it also says, and it taught the monarchy not to exceed the bounds of their just and fair rule. You see, this is a monument posted after the fact by the winners who weren't the winners because they lost. It's all a mess. This battle might have given us democracy, but ultimately it's the monarchy who rules Britain. So you read that and you think the royalists won. But, and, and you read that and you think it was this battle that caused the civil war. And it wasn't. This battle decided the Civil War. It's a case of the victor writes the history books, or in this case, the loser who then got back in power wrote the history book. Anyway, Oliver Cromwell met Lord Fairfax the day before battle at the windmill that once stood here, and they repositioned their army. See, Fairfax had quite cleverly positioned his army on a defensive formation near a ridge. 
Cromwell wanted to gallivant around with his troops, with his horsemen. He didn't see how that was possible if he was fighting defensively behind a ridge, so he made Fairfax move the formation under the guise of if we hold this position, the Royalists will never attack us. So they, uh, they decided to... I'm being signalled by my cameraman to hurry up. We're probably running out... Are we out of battery? I've got spare battery. OK, apparently we're all right. So, so they repositioned their army so that Cromwell could show off because I guess he loved the idea of his dick swinging in the wind. What a twat. He was a bit of an arsehole. He plunged Britain into a puritanical crusade that saw the end of our May Day festivities and would ultimately go on to be the scourge of Ireland and create a hostility that still exists to this day. So the whole thing's a bit of a bloody mess, really, isn't it? The Parliamentarians' new model army formed the basis of what would go on to become the British Army, the first professional fighting force, full-time soldiers. At the Battle of Naseby, their defeat over the Royalists really ended any significant chance the Royals had of, of ever winning the war. Their army was broken. Any veterans that they had were slain. 6,000 men died in these fields just on the Royalist side alone. They only came into the battle with just over 7,000. And that was pretty much the end of it. After the battle, Fairfax found the reprisals against the Royals somewhat difficult to stomach and he left the Parliamentarian cause. A fact which after Cromwell's death, when Cromwell's body was dug up from its grave, hung, drawn and quartered by Charles II, who resumed the throne. It, uh, it paid Fairfax well. He was the only one of the rebels to be led off lightly. It was a war that Parliament won, but the individuals involved, apart from Fairfax, well, they kind of lost it all when Charles II retook the throne. The battle between the monarchy and Parliament would rage for years to come, but in a political sphere, instead of a bloodbath like the one that happened here 400 years ago. The thing I found fascinating about the Naseby battle site is how it's remembered. So the site of Oliver Cromwell's charge is marked by a small obelisk and Interestingly, some of the locals leave little flowers and messages there to lost loved ones, which is quite an interesting bit of local flavour. But that tiny obelisk marking the hero of the revolution is... it pales into insignificance next to the gigantic obelisk erected by Lord and Lady Fitzgerald of the Naseby Manor. And that tells a story on its plaque about, you know, how how rebellion, as, as you know, the British people know not to rebel now because you know it's anarchy and, uh, and the royalty will, will will keep themselves in check. And it's this interesting dichotomy of of things like the the King Charles tree being removed. Well because that's where he hid for a while and, and that's an embarrassment so let's just chop that down, that never happened. So let's chisel in the inscription of our monument. What should we go with? Uh, here was fought the Great Battle of Central. And uh, so we've got to sort of accept a little bit of a lesson instead of accept the defeat. So, uh, where kings learned to rule with moderation. Well, I don't quite film the line, damn it. Ah. Computers to rule with moderation. 
and orcs, orca, I should call them in the inscription, learned, what should we have, learned their place, yeah, let's be quite literal, where, and orca learned their place, because, you know, these are people that still, that, that don't necessarily fully accept the other, so there we go, and there's the inscription on the monument that stands on the road from Imperius to Central that has been erected at the furthest point where orcs are allowed to travel. So thank you for watching this video from Pair of Geeks. It's been a little dive into history and a little explore of ancient battle sites and stuff and just seeing how that would inspire our, well, my own games and maybe you learned something from that too. So, I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you for watching. If you did, please consider subscribing. Maybe you want to join our fan club thing, the Fruit Bowls. Um, maybe you'll like the video. Maybe you'll comment. Maybe you'll correct my terrible history. It's always good when I do history stuff, because all the history buffs go, You're wrong! So, if you want to know what actually happened, read the comments. Um, so, yeah, um, consider, please consider our Patreon and all that stuff. Uh, there's probably music playing now, and... and credits rolling and in a moment and in fact maybe it's already started there, there will be videos on screen so I'm looking this way because the scene with my hands are good anyway look thank you and hope you enjoyed it and um, see you soon